This thing has more memory than my entire computer, my memory stick, 64 gigabyte. I'll probably leave that here. That'll be a problem. <laughs> so I, you notice I talk funny. I sort of talk like him. <clears throat> <laughs> well, thank you. thanks for coming. Uh, we're glad you're here. I uh, just told that from the airlines. They, they spent, a, I think, a million dollars getting that. I just hope it. So, but I, but I am happy to be here. I really am. And uh, I, I am hoping there's ethanol later. We'll solve that ethanol problem temporarily. <laughs> so, uh, I know I'm the one that's keeping you from dinner and uh, ethanol, so that, uh, that's always a problem. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, actually, not, not the good kind, but uh, the, the doctor of philosophy. So I'm a philosopher that doesn't actually pay that well. Um, kind of why I'm here. But <laughs> and, no, it, is, it is a pleasure to be here. Now, and before I forget it, I have to acknowledge some of my co-authors uh, co here. Uh, these are people that actually know what they're doing. So uh, they, they plant the crop and harvest it. I, I have a big mouth, so I get to come and talk to you about it, but uh, I, I have to acknowledge that. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about high-yield corn and soybean. And I, I, t I titled my, my talk The Quest. And so this is supposed to conjure up some sort of heroic crusade, you know, to save the world with crops. And uh, the, the world's problem is uh, procreation. Uh, too, too many people. Um, you, you know, I know you've heard this a bunch of times, but in the next 40 years, the population of the world is going to be 9 billion. And, uh, you know, the good news is most of them won't be around here. Well, maybe they were. But they will be around here. I'm told there's oil here. So, uh, but most of, the, most of the new people are going to be in developing parts of the world. And in order to feed those people, we have to double crop production over its current levels. And that's all crops. I'm, I'm going to only talk about corn and soybean, but uh, that, that involves the rest of them as, as well. And so, uh, you know, if we don't double crop production in the next 40 years, well, if you like watching Save the Children commercials, you're going to be really happy. Or uh, otherwise, I suppose the price of grains is going to skyrocket. So I, I did the math. You know, if the uh, average yield in the U.S. is uh, normally around uh, corn, normally around 150 bushels, um, I did the math. It's uh, 300 is the holy grail. And then if uh, the... Uh, if the normal soybean yield is uh, in the U.S. is around 42 bushels, then you know my my, my quest was 85, so I doubled it and added a little bit. I, I know 100 sounds better, but it's way harder. So uh, 85 would uh, would be doubling it. So 300 bushel corn, 85 bushel soybean. That's the that's the quest. Now it can be done. Every year, somebody in the U.S. National Corn Growers Contest does grow 300 bushel corn, and while there isn't a uh, a national soybean contest, there's state contests. Every year somebody grows uh, 85 bushel of soybean. So, so it can be done. We, we, you know, last year, this guy in Virginia, he grew 429 bushels of corn. That didn't even know they grew corn in Virginia, but it uh, <laughs> certainly shows it can be done. And the same guy won the, uh, won the contest uh, this year, 378. So it shows it can be done. You know, and I spoke with this guy, and he swears to me he's making money do, doing that, but I'm, Pretty sure it's on the endorsements. <clears throat> so you you know how you know you know what you do in a contest. You know how you know you find a sweet spot on the yield monitor and then you throw everything at it. Okay, no regard to economics, because this is all about celebration. If you can win that contest, so I mean you know that guy uh, that guy that's got the record soybean yield, uh, 161 bushels. I even know his name um, because he's done so many endorsements. So th this is about celebration. Now, it does show it's possible, but I'm pretty sure that's not the way we're going to you know, feed the world and have you guys make money. I, I think we're going to have to use what I call intelligent intensification. And so intelligence is, you know, allegedly what you, what you get at these kind of meetings. And then the intensification is all those fine uh, production and protection and genetic products, you know, that Arthur's can, Arthur companies can sell you. And the idea is you're going to put them in all in the right place at the right time in some sort of grand finale of yield. And if I, if I want to grow high corn and soybean yield, and you know, I kind of do at today's prices, 
Um, I want to know those factors that have the biggest impact on corn and soybean yield, and I want to get those right. And so that's where my, uh, my so-called seven wonders of the corn yield world come in. And then I guess the, the flip side of that is the six secrets of, uh, of soybean success. I'm going to talk about corn first, because I, I, I know more about it. And then I'll, I'll finish with, uh, with soybean. So my, uh, my seven wonders of the corn yield world. It's my top seven list of those factors that each year can have a positive, and the bad news is if you're not intelligent enough or unlucky, sometimes a negative impact on crop yield. Um, I know some of you have heard this. How many of you have heard this? Uh, milk is puppy to death, so <clears throat> I mean, I, I know you've heard it, but uh, I, I've learned from my teaching that sadly sometimes students don't learn it the first time you tell it to them, so maybe this is good review if you have learned it. Uh, I'm going to go through each one of these wonders. I'll justify some of them. I don't have time to do them all. But I'll justify some of them, and then I'll show you how knowing this information can allow you to put together a systems approach, a high-tech package, you know, to bring you to the, the sort of the, closer to the, the 300 bushel corn part. So I'm going to go through each one of those. And, and I'm going to give each one of these factors a bushel per acre value. And I, I want you to recognize that that value I give it is an average of a range. Sometimes that range is pretty large. And of course, the, the, my research is all done in that you know nefarious ice cave that's uh, south and east of here, and it could be different here. So uh, um, uh, uh, now, here, uh, before I before I get into this, here here's a sad fact of life. It's what I call prerequisites. And a prerequisite is, is what you have to have or do before you can have or do what you want to do. I mean, Mike will tell you the lending industry uses a lot of prerequisites. That's what your credit score is about. You know, apparently you have to pay back that first loan to get the second one. Uh, and if you want to send your son or daughter to a fantastic school like the University of Illinois, well, they need certain prerequisites. They have to have a high school degree, pretty good one, good test scores, a lot of money. I mean, those are the prerequisites. And, and there's some prerequisites to the seven wonders to it. I don't mean they're not important, they're actually crucial. But the way that we manage them, they either don't and yield. But they don't necessarily have to be done every year. So, and, you know, in, in my state, uh, what my state would be a festering slump if it wasn't for tile drainage. And now the tile guy says, I get a new tile between all my other tiles. Geez, that's pretty expensive. Man, I have it when it's done. You know, we still have yield, rather not have any. There, there's actually some people that truly believe that mixed communities and plants are better than monoculture. I call them ecologists. <laughs> but, uh, I'd rather not have any weeds. And I, and I want to harp on this one a little bit. You know how you base your soil fertility? It's on a soil test. And so the soil test tells you what you need to add, and then the uh, yield tells you what you need to replace. Geez, this has worked fairly well for the last 50 years. So these are the prerequisites that goes to the seven wonders. And I'll assume you have most of those met, but the Arthur guys can help you with that. And then what are the top seven factors that each year Give a positive impact on crop yield. I'm going to go through each one of these. I'll give each one of them a value, uh, and I'll justify some of them, the ones I have time for. And, and normally, if this was my normal top seven list, I would add three more, and I'd go from the bottom to the top in some sort of dramatic fashion. I'm not sure where I got that from. But <laughs> I'm going to go top down instead. And there's a reason for that, and, and you already know the fact that it has the biggest impact on your corn productivity. It's, Typically, the one you have the least control over is the weather, Mother Nature. So I like to make a smug recommendation for high yield, and it goes like this, black early. Well, good luck with that if the weather's not in the mood. It's the weather that dictates when you plant, and it's the weather after your planting date that dictates the success of that planting. As much as I want to plant early and be done with it, completely controlled by the weather. So early planting is not one of them. Seven wonders. You know, if I have my weather wish for corn, I'd like to have a warm, moist spring. I'd like rain in July. Well, I learned this year, I'd like it in June, too. And then I'd like nothing but sunny days and cool nights in August. Rarely do I get my weather wish. Usually the best weather is north, south, east, or west of where my research plots are. You're blessed by the fact that I don't have any research in this area. <laughs> and, and the good news is, the good news is, whenever when, when any of my grand agronomic schemes don't work, you know, which sadly is fairly often, I just blame the weather, and it's usually true. And you know what you do if the weather's not working for you? You refer to the weather using that pregnant dog term, 
You say, man, this weather's a real pregnant dog. And I'll tell you, 2012's weather was a real pregnant dog. You know, harking back to, harking back to July uh, last year, a uh, U.S. drought monitor, and a lot of the carbon belt was mirrored in drought. You guys were a little lucky here. Let me play geography. I mean, so you had some drought. Well, I mean, you had some, you, you had, you had some severe drought and some moderate drought. But you didn't have it as bad as my state. Here's my state here. My entire state was mirrored in severe, extreme, or exceptional drought. I didn't even know there was such a thing called exceptional drought. You know, usually when I use the word exceptional, it's good. Not when it comes to drought. So, I mean, look at how much of the corn belt was mirrored in drought in 2012. In fact, the drought was so severe in 2012, look, it made it all the way over here to Hawaii. So, talk about spraying the dog weather here. I'm not glad I'm done with that one. So, uh, what's number two? And this is allegedly the factor that, uh, under your control, that has the biggest impact on your corn productivity. And that's your nitrogen fertilizer management. We give it an seven emotional value here. And, and that would be the difference between if you use no nitrogen or you use the exact right amount, seven emotions. Now remember, this is a ranch. And, and I said this is the factor under your control that had the biggest impact on your crop productivity. But that's kind of a misnomer, because here's a little nuance of all of these wonders. They interact with each other. And as a rough rule of thumb, the higher you are on the wonder list, the more control you exert over those wonders below you. I want you to think about nitrogen fertilizer management. Every single thing about it is influenced by the weather. The ability to apply it, whether it's lost or available, or whether the crop can use it. That's an example of a weather-nitrogen interaction. So I'm going to jump right to number three, because number three is the most important decision as far as you make every year. And that is your hybrid selection. Oh boy, all hybrids aren't created equal. You know, otherwise, why would you need more than one seed company? And, uh, and all, seed, all, all seed numbers of the same brand aren't created equal. This is the most important decision you're making uh, every year. And, and I'm struck by how much emotion rather than rational thinking goes into a lot of growers' hybrid selection. Man, I watch growers, they'll, they'll agonize down to the last time about their nitrogen management. You know, should we weatherproof it? And then they'll turn around and buy some crappy hybrid off their cousin or their neighbor because that's the way they've always done it. <laughs> Big mistake. And, and it's getting harder and harder with biotechnology. You know, pretty soon we'll have drought tolerant hybrids. Well, we already have some. You know, they have to control the weather. And then pretty soon we'll have nitrogen use efficient hybrids. And that, that's not hybrids that use less than it's hybrids that get more yield out of each pile. I can only imagine what that seed's going to cost, but uh, we'll look at the value. So hybrid selection, this is the most important decision you make uh, uh, every year. And normally, when, when I screen a bunch of frontline commercial hybrids, I see a 50 bushel difference between the highest and the lowest. But guess what, if I have a pregnant dog weather year, oh, that swing is even worse. Man, you want to see a hybrid's metal, you just throw bad weather at it. So I'll show you a variety testing trial at my site uh, last year. Um, 64 commercial hybrids, representing all seed brands, all with uh, above and below ground biotech insect protection. So all, all frontline commercial hybrids. And do you know what a variety testing trial is? It's a beauty contest for corn hybrids. So you, you know what I do on a variety testing trial is I don't plant too many plants and I put a lot of hydrogen on it. Because I can't have you drive by my variety testing trial and see yellow from the windshield. You know, so here's, a, here's one of my variety testing trials at my site of last year, pregnant dog weather year. 32,000 plants per acre, that'd be a low stand for my area. 240 pounds of N, that'd be a lot of N. This is the way they're typically done. And then what I've done is I've ranked the yield of these 64 hybrids according to their highest yield and their lowest yield. And I've left the name of the hybrids out to protect the innocent, you know, which are largely these guys. <laughs> but look at the swinging yields here between the top yielding hybrid and the bottom yielding hybrid. 85 bushels. Man, if my cousin sold me one of those at $7 corn, that's a $600 per acre mistake. And if he sold me a bulk planter box of that, you know, I planted 100 acres, oh man, the zero's adding up fast. Hybrid selection is the most important decision you make every year. Getting harder and harder with biotechnology. So what about number four? Number four. This, uh, you know, I'm from the great corn and soybean desert. 
we hadn't figured out how to grow anything else. You, you guys are the new California, so you have a whole range of different crops. But uh, in, in my state, it's corn or soybean. And if soybean was the previous crop, then I scored 25 bushels advantage on my next year's corn crop. I don't have to do anything. It's like that's great. Right? I just take it. But if corn was my previous crop, then it goes the other way around. I give up 25 bushels. It's called a continuous corn yield penalty. Now, a lot of guys from my state, they're willing to give up that 25 bushel penalty because they like their own corn more than soybean, and apparently they make more money than corn. But, uh, geez, I'd rather not give it up. And uh, I'm going I'm to dispel a, 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 rural, a rural myth or a rural legend, and it goes like this. The, the legend goes, well, I take my biggest yield head when I'm, uh, when I'm on the second or the third year of corn on corn, and as long as I stick with it, the penalty goes away with time. Some sort of magic equilibration occurs. That's not what I see. I think you simply forget about the penalty. The penalty gets worse with time. It doesn't get better. I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into the data and show it to you because I don't have enough time. But the penalty gets worse with time, not better. And it's due to the residue. It's, you know, it's what I call the cemetery effect. You know, think about it after the seven or eight years, how much residue you got. You know, and, and, and it's the cemetery effect. As, as much as, uh, as nice as cemeteries are, geez, I don't visit them for a good time. You know, usually there's lots of pride there, and uh, part of life doesn't like to live in the dead, decomposing bodies of the previous crop. I hardly blame it. It's the residue. The residue sucks up nutrients, releases compounds that are toxic to the corn roots. And if you have a pregnant dog, well, they're here, it's even worse. You know, so if you can take the residue off and feed it to an animal, that's cheating. <clears throat> and also put the manure back. And uh, I won't admit I said this, but if every now and then you can bury the dead with an illegal tillage tool, that's a temporary fix. <clears throat> it's the residue which is the problem. So, so what's number five? And this is the seed company's favorite one. Boy, they like, they like number three, but they really like number five. You know, and if I'm a seed salesman, man, seed in the ground, make the world go round. And you're going to think I'm in cahoots with the seed company when I tell you that mostly you're, you're, not get, you're giving them 20 bushels because you're not planting enough plants. Plant population is number five. Now that, that could be plant density, seeding rate, stand, you know, how many seeds per acre you plant. And this is one that can go either way, it can go up or down. But most of you are giving up 20 bushels because you're not planting enough seed. And I know why you're not planting enough seed. There's two reasons. One of them has to do with its high cost. You know, today's seed prices, you get about, you get a little bit more than two seed for a penny. So if you're, you're one of these guys who picks up a penny, you better pick up two seed too. Uh, and uh, unlike most technologies, they go down with time, you know, my smartphone or my, my big screen TV, uh, I'm told seed prices are never going to go down. They're only going to go up. So uh, that's one reason you're not planting enough seed. And then the other reason is you're, you're worried about what if I have a pregnant dog with me? You know, what if I don't have enough soil moisture? And, and you'd have been partially justified by that in 2012. But I'm going to tell you that this is the factor that, that I'm going to say has changed the most in your farming career. And this is the factor that has to go up in order to grow high yields. I, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this one because it's so important. And, and I'm going to show, what I'll show you is I'm going to show you the average yield of the U.S. over the last 50 years, average corn yield. And then I'll superimpose on that the average black population grown in the U.S. Over the, over the same time period. So here's the 50-year uh, here's the period. Here's great yield. It's in orange. A lot of orange, by the way. And then uh, the plant density is in blue, a lot of blue. And if you look at the yield, you can see the yield goes up and down depending on that year's weather. I mean, there's the, the, the drought of 88. I, 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 I've been too afraid to put the 2012 on here, but it's down here somewhere. Uh, and, but, but overall, the yield's gone up two bushels per acre per year over the last 50 years. And along with that, there's been a steady increase in the number of plants planted, the plant population. Okay, harking back to 1965, you know, the average yield in the U.S. around 70 bushels per acre, and then the average density is less than 18,000 plants per acre. And now 50 years later, when the average yield in the U.S. is more than double, now we're up over 30,000 plants. And, it, and guess what? It, it has to go higher. It has to go higher to grow high yield. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons the plant population is so important in high yield is it is a component of corn yield. You can make corn yield into a math equation by multiplying three things together. I call this a yield algorithm. So, so uh, grain yield of corn is a function of, product function of how many plants you have per acre, 
times how many kernels are on every plant times the weight of each individual kernel. And an increase or decrease in any one of those could be responsible for an increase or decrease in yield. And they act at different times with growth in the life of the plant. I mean, plants per acre, that's in planting and emergence. Kernels per plant, this is in the determinant part of plant. This is the, the period right around the flowering. And weight per kernel, that's, that, that's the period during grade filling. Now, I measure these yield components all the time. And this is how I can tell if you're lying to me about the yield you claim to have achieved. I can tell you exactly what a 200 or 250 bushel corn crop looks like yield component wise. And I'll speculate what the, your yield components are going to have to look like you know, to grow the holy grip. You know, this is 300 bushels per acre. So 200 bushel corn, this is what it's going to look like every time. It's going to be 32,000 plants per acre. Each plant, all 32,000, are going to have, each plant's going to have 550 kernels. That's an area that has 16 kernel rows, which is, which is 34 kernels long, or 18 kernel rows by 30. You know, all 32,000. And then each individual kernel is going to weigh 250 milligrams. See, being a scientist, I use the metric milligram here to make this a little more scientific. This is uh, four kernels per gram, and that's dry weight. So if you want to check my math, you have to add the 15.5% moisture to the kernel weight. You're going to have to do the metric English conversion and you know some other multiplication or division, or just take my word for it. No. <laughs> that's 200 bushels. What does 250 bushels like, look like? And 250 bushels is readily achievable with today's genetics and crop management. And this is what it looks like yield component-wise. It's 36,000 plants per acre, 4,000 more. Okay, sadly, I have to actually purchase and plant that seed because rarely a more seed emerges than I plant. It's usually the other way around. <laughs> Each plant has to have 600 kernels, 50 more. Okay, you might get that by weather luck. You know, that perfect weather and flowering. But more than likely, you're gonna have to manage it. Yeah, and, and then uh, they talk about the need for like, leaf performance, staggering. Each kernel is going to have to be five milligrams <coughs> heavier. Okay, so see the strategy here? Go from 200 to 250. It's fairly easy. I just eat all, all the yield components. And I said it was fairly easy to go from 200 to 250. It is a huge challenge to go from 250 to 300. Now let me show you this challenge yield component box. This is what it looks like. Talk about seed sticker shock. It's 45,000 plants per acre. Okay, don't try that at home. That's for trained professionals only, like myself, who basically get their seed and their inputs for free. Um, 40, 45,000 plants per acre. Each plant, all 45,000, has to have 565 kernels. Notice I backed off the number of kernels that have to be on, on each plant to grow 300 bushels over what it takes to grow 200. But you have to have more kernels on every plant, 45,000 of them, than you do when, when you only have 32,000 to grow 200 bushels. This is a huge challenge, taking some serious management. You know, again, talk about the need for even better leaves. Each leaf, each kernel has to be five milligrams a day. It is an unbelievable challenge to grow from 250 to 300 bushels. So I can show it to you the yield component wise. Now, this is math, so you can play around these numbers. And, you know, you can get to the, the loose of 300 bushels a bunch, uh, a couple other ways. You know, I've heard it a million times. I know you, your cousin who sells you the crappy hybrids claims to have grown 300 bushels and 32,000 plants per acre. And guess what? Every ear has to have a thousand kernels. <laughs> it's a fish story. I mean, you might catch a big fish every now and then, but it's going to happen routinely. You're going to have to bite the bullet and plant more plants. Hate to tell you. Of course, and you know the problem with this, in addition to the high seed cost, is that uh, you know, plants compete with each other. You know, so, uh, you know, how am I going to get 45,000 plants out there? And one way to get more plants in the same area is to change your row arrangement or your row configuration. And in twin rows is one example. Oh, man, did I like twin rows uh, in, in 2009. Here, you know what a twin row is? Here's a seven and a half inch twin row on a, on a 32 and a half inch, on a 32 inch center. So this is 22 and a half. And, and oh, man, I can tell you all the virtues of twin rows in 2009. I mean, first of all, this is one way for me to intercept more light early. And I show you, here's 45,000 plants in a 30 inch row, here's 45,000 plants in a twin row, and which one of these things do you think intercepts more early light? 
right? I'll play I got your hero. It's an A, a B, a B, a A. And your CDL license is at stake here. So, I mean, you get it every time, it's B. I mean, so I, I space these plants out, I can hear some more early life. Man, I love that. I also like the seven and a half inch area here, because I think that's the perfect place to put some uh, bands and fertilizer, take advantage of that zone. And, and if you ever looked at uh, corn plants, corn plants act as funnels, you know, their architecture. So a corn plant will take a tenth of an inch of rain, and it'll funnel it down the stem to three tenths of an inch. Sometimes they'll even funnel a heavy dew. And, and guess what? Twin rows are twin funnels. And so I, uh, here's a 45,000 plant per acre twin row on my site in 2009. It was so dark in this canopy, I had to use a flash to take this picture. And this is right after a tenth of an inch of rain. Okay, and you notice the canopy is so tight that between the rows it's dry. But that crop has taken a tenth of an inch of rain and funneled it right down here. And this is where I'm pretty sure the roots are. Um, so, oh man, did I like twin rows in 2009. That was before I was jaded by failure. I never saw it coming. Do you know what the Achilles heel of a twin row is? Any idea? Mike, it's some trout. Look at all that water there, Mike. <clears throat> so apparently, and I never saw this coming, uh, apparently a 45,000 of us got out, got out in, a hot, in, a, in a field in a hot August night. 